to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, Roach Growth listeners. Today I have Herman uh, Simon. He is the founder of Simon Kucher and Partners. This is the first. Uh, his company, they basically consult based off of pricing. So, you know, you ever get this question, you build a product and you're kind of thinking, what should I sell this for? Well, you know what? There's a person, there's a company, there's an entity that can help you out. Thank you, Herman, for being here today. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Me too. Well, let's, I mean, let's talk about it. I mean, how would you describe your company? How, if someone goes, Hey Herman, what do you do? How do you describe it? As a general description, we say profitable growth. We help our clients to achieve profitable growth. And the main driver of profit is price. And so we are the specialist for pricing. We have 750 people who only focus on price and profit. And they work all over the world across all sectors. We have many companies in the, in the Silicon Valley, but also banks, automotive companies, every sector of industry and consumer products. Well, I mean, before we get into your journey, just a really cool question. And I mean, we're filming, we're filming this right now in April, end of April. The audio might be a couple months later. Uh, so be aware some of the topics we might be talking about might be a little bit different when that time comes about. And what the idea is, is like fair market is you basically have a product and what the society, what the people will pay for it. Yet with inflation going on, how does that adjust? How does that work for you guys in helping people uh, better adjust to pricing out there? That is a big challenge. Your cost increase. What do you do? You have to increase your prices. But there's something like the willingness to pay. Does the willingness to pay of consumers, of industrial buyers also increase? So do you have pricing power? If you don't have pricing power, you are squeezed between costs and the uh, impossibility to increase your prices. So creating pricing power, really understanding how the consumer reacts are the roots of success in, in the inflation. And I'm just finalizing a book on uh, pricing and inflation. So you have to, you need a deep understanding of what is going on. We see, for instance, that people still are willing to pay a lot for vacations because they couldn't go for vacations for two years due to COVID-19, but they save mo uh, money at the, uh, the, the, the supermarkets, yeah, they are very price sensitive. For other things, they are still willing to pay a lot. So you have to understand these differences. Well, let's rewind. Who was a young Herman? I mean, was he into pricing? Was he into business? I mean, was he into making money? Who was a young Herman? The young Herman grew up on a farm in the Middle Ages, you could say. And I described mm -hmm. that in this book, many world's one life a remarkable journey from farmhouse to the global stage and i encountered prices very early because my father sold the pigs the hogs on the market and he had no influence on price but because the price was determined by demand and supply and i i did not fully understand it, but I, I think at that time I, I made the decision that I never want to be in a business where you have no influence on price. <laughs> and I really stumbled into pricing with my doctoral uh, dissertation uh, 20, 25 years later, which was on pricing strategy for new products. And ever since then, that was 1973, I have uh, stuck to the pricing challenges. Well, let, let's 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 go into that little bit of a gap from being a child to 25 years later. After you you get off the farm, going to schooling. I mean, what happens next after after the farm? After the farm, I joined the German Air Force because I wanted to become a starfighter pilot. Starfighter Lockheed F-104 was the 
jet fighter of the German Air Force, but I failed due to uh, partial color blindness. And so I could not uh, fulfill my dream of my childhood and youth, but I still joined the Air Force in a very hot phase. Uh, I was in a, in a fighter wing, which, uh, which had the only mission to drop American nuclear bombs on certain targets on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So that reminds me of the current situation with Ukraine. I have seen that in 1968 when the Russians marched into Czechoslovakia and we were always on high NATO alert. And uh, after that, I decided to uh, study economics and uh, got into this rather new area of pricing. Now, you wanted to be in the military. You wanted to, to serve your country. You wanted to fly. How does that, that person transition into economics? Was it sitting back, going, thinking back about who you were on the farm? Or what was the mindset there? Uh, the mindset was that during my time in the Air Force, I, I read a lot about various fields like sociology and economics, and I got really interested in economics and um, then decided to, to study economics. And, and later on, I got very well familiar with the American marketing scene. I, I spent a year at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a semester at Stanford, a year at Harvard. And uh, this whole field, especially with the focus on pricing, was very new. We are the innovator, the pioneer in this field. And uh, it's amazing, even after 40 or 50 years, we still detect new ideas almost every week, new schemes, uh, the internet makes, we have seen more innovations in pricing in the last 30 years than in the 3000 years before. And I could tell you an interesting story. Socrates, the Greek philosopher who lived 2500 years ago, he said, the value of, the, of a product is not derived from the ownership, but from the use of the product. I don't need to own a car, a scooter, a bicycle, but I want to use it. So you could say Socrates is the father of the sharing economy. Hmm. But why was this idea not implemented over 2,500 years? Because we did not have the technology. If you sell an electric scooter for $1,000, that's one transaction. The product, the price. If you sell it by the minute, it's thousands of transactions. And that only became doable, implementable with the internet. So the internet opened so many uh, roads to innovations in pricing that we have a new idea every week, practically every week. You're so you're studying for economics, you're in schooling in after you leave the military. How are you you making money? How are you surviving uh, while you're going to school? And then what happens next after you graduate from university? I had a couple of, of jobs. I did not get uh, money from my parents because they didn't have the means. And I, I also got a, a scholarship. So I was okay, quite well off financially during my study times. And uh, then when I became a professor later, I was a pro university professor for 16 years. I always had the ambition to have an impact on practice, not to do only theoretical research. And I think that is the root of my entrepreneurial spirit. And of course, I also wanted to make some money. The salary of, of a professor is not uh, really very high. So if you can make some money by giving speeches, uh, doing consulting on the side. That's uh, a good addition to your, your, your base income. But the root there is the entrepreneurial spirit. And that leads me again back to the farm. My father was, you could say, a poor farmer, but he was independent. He had nobody who told him to start work at eight or what to do. He was an independent man. And I also wanted to become an independent entrepreneur, uh, gave my professorship, tenured professorship after 16 years and uh, went full time into our 
consulting company. So you're doing, you're, you're being a professor uh, and you're doing the consulting on the side, doing speaking engagements. When was the point in time or when did you know that it was ready to give up the professorship and go fully into consulting, uh, writing books? Was there like a, a set pricing that you had enough money saved in the books or was it more gut or what was that, that time like? No, the reason was that I, I was chasing too many hairs. I was a professor. I did consulting. I gave speeches. I was on seven boards of companies and I got into politics. Uh -huh. So in 94, I made the decision. I focus only on one, on one thing. And I had let, learned that from the hidden champions. The hidden champions are mid-sized, little known market leaders, global market leaders. And they focus on a niche business. And our pricing is a niche business. We are not competing across the field against McKinsey or Boston Consulting. We focus on pricing. But there, we have the ambition to be the best. So it came from this entrepreneurial roots plus the idea to focus on one thing and to pursue this with all your energy and your concentration. Now, I, I know you weren't making that much money as a professor. It was still a base so salary that you're making. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So was it was it any kind of fearful of giving up that consistent income? Nobody in my environment understood that decision that I could give up a tenured position, lifelong tenured position as a professor and go into entrepreneurship. But I, I did not really jump into the cold water because we had started the consulting business a few years earlier. And when I came on board, uh, we had about 30 people. Today, as I said, we have uh, 1,750. Um, so it was not a start from zero. And as you say, the salary of the professor was kind of a, of a, of a startup financing because uh, I, I, I had enough to live. Um, but the decision to go for entrepreneurship was still a kind of fundamental reorientation of my life. Now you're you're in the consulting business. You're, you're you're growing. You're getting business off it. Was there ever a moment in the consulting uh, consulting business where you wanted had that urge to start a business from the ground up, something separate, something where you're selling a, a I guess a product? We 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 did that actually. We oh. we actually <laughs> had two attempts of of starting slightly different businesses. One was an education company. At that time, there was no part-time MBA, like the executive MBA in Germany, and we wanted to offer something like this. We had set up the company in, in, in Munich, in Germany, and our main customer was supposed to be Siemens, a large industrial conglomerate, and they were very interested to have business education for their engineers and scientists. But that then... One day, the CEO of business uh, of Siemens said, we, we can't do it. Uh, we cannot let them go for education one or two week, uh, two days per week. And so I gave that up. We had invested uh, a couple of hundred thousand, but it was not a big, big failure. Another interesting new venture we had is that is called economic consultant. That's not really consulting. It's expert witness. Like uh, in, 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 in litigation, or you could say it's litigation consulting, you ask as experts what would have happened if uh, they had not violated the patent or things like that. And there we actually did some projects. One was, for instance, for Coca-Cola, related to an, an acquisition of another brand. And then it turned out that it was not um, feasible. It was in, in irreconcilable with the consulting business, because the judge, the first thing he asked us, are you also doing consulting for this firm? <laughs> I had to say yes. And so then they said, but then you are not neutral. And uh, <laughs> this question was asked a couple of times in, in these events. And uh, then I said, uh, this is not uh, 
feasible that we do that. And we, we, we gave that up. So these were two attempts to go into other, other businesses related to management, education, to, to litigation consulting. But the, the most important step in our development was to go international. Hmm. I said, we are focused on pricing. That makes the market small. If we stay only in California or Germany with such a niche, it will be a very small company. And how do you make the market large? By globalizing. And our first step towards globalization was to go to the US. So far, that was in 96, uh, just the year after I came full time on board as CEO, that we said we want to become a global consulting company. And that means that we have to prove ourselves in the lion's den, that's the United States. That's why we did not go to Switzerland or Austria, where people speak German. We went to Boston and uh, made it there. I think that thing, as, as a single step, that was the most important step in our career. Because after we had proven that we could make it in the United States, uh, the other countries were, were easier, were doable. Because the competition there was not so tough. What, what was your, your original fear of expanding into the U.S.? Yeah, nobody knows us. You are there. You are totally unknown. You you have to hire people. We sent over a young partner, uh, and he he started to build the business. I I flew every month to uh, the U.S. to visit customers, etc. And there's no guarantee that you will make it. That they uh, accept a new a small consultancy from Germany to advise them on pricing. And it took a couple of years. Uh, but we made it. How did you find the right partner to um, spearhead, I guess, the expansion to the U.S.? The, the first partners were all doctoral students of me from the university. Hmm. And they had all been in the U.S. During the doctoral studies, I always sent them to the U.S. And this guy, uh, his name is Klaus. He spent some time at UCLA in Los Angeles. So they were all rather familiar with the US environment. And then, of course, uh, he had to be willing. So we asked, we had at that time six, seven partners who is willing to go. Klaus was willing to go with his family and uh, he built the business there. Uh, that is the key. And I had the four, my four first doctoral students who joined the company in 1985 and 1988 and all these four worked their whole life for simon kutcher and that's mm -hmm. the thing i'm most proud of so we had a, a gang of five these four former doctoral students and myself we all worked our whole life for simon kutcher i'm a big fan of continuity of of loyalty from the side of the company, from the side of the founder, but also from the side of the partners and the uh, the employees. Was so a lot of your students were kind of how you found your original partners and even employees too, or was it through the university? Any of your employees also? They were also employees at the university. Assistants. A professor in Germany has a couple of assistants who are paid a modest salary and help him do research, also teaching, uh, running exams, etc. And uh, they all worked in their doctoral dissertations on pricing issues. So they were also very deep into this matter. This made Simon Kutcher valuable for them because that was the field where they had their highest competencies. And of course, they were very valuable for our company because they were true experts. And uh, they also knew the American and they had worked at the top university. One was at the University of Chicago, uh, the other is at Stanford, the other at UCLA. So they had already an academic network in the United States, which helped us also to get started there. Once you left your professorship, right, you, I guess, lost some of the ability for. Um, uh, employees for future partners, right? You lost that a little bit of that connection. How did you 
start keep with your hiring process because you had it, the ability to know these people, how good they were, yeah. how yeah. uh, detail oriented, um, how hungry they were. And I guess once you left that partnership, you didn't probably have that hands on ability to do that anymore. Yeah, is that is true for the direct hands on connections. But I kept the network to the universities. For instance, we ran run every year a, a, a doctoral workshop where in white we invite in, in, in Germany 20 uh, doctoral students from various universities. I also kept the network, my network in the United States and other countries. And that was extremely helpful to get good graduates from the top schools. I would say in a, in a, in a, in a brain capital business, consulting is a brain capital business, the, the key is people. And uh, we got really top graduates from top American, from French, from uh, Japanese universities. And that came partially through this old network uh, among academics. Now, looking at the, I mean, where you've expanded to in all the different countries, is there different traits to different countries when you look at pricing? Not really. Uh, let me distinguish between industrial markets. So B2B, they are very standardized across the world. Industrial processes are very, very similar. They use the same robots, uh, the, the same machines. For consumers, it's of course different. You have certain consumer habits, but still it comes back to the, the, the basic issue we talk about price, but we really, before we determine the price or give a recommendation on price, we have to understand the value. So you could say we are truly value consultant, consultants because the, the willingness to pay a price is only the reflection of the perceived value. And that is a very interesting old truth, you could say. The Romans in their Latin language have the same word for value and price. It's precium, like in precious. And that is the fundamental eternal equation of pricing. You have to understand the value. You have to create value, to communicate value, and to quantify it. Because the price is a number, the value is not a number, but you have to understand how it translates in a... In a, a certain willingness to pay and that is a number and uh, this fundamental equation again is true across countries but what loads the value is it the brand is it the service is it the technical capabilities uh, the, the longevity of the product that may be different from country to country the role of status for instance is very very different uh, premium cars, prestige cars play a much bigger role in China than they do in the United States. In the United States, most people consider car a commodity. In China, it's a symbol of your social status. When you're looking at value and assessing value and then going and assessing price, is there a structure that you do that's um, systematic for every product you look at or how much of a variance is there when you go to different companies and different entities? Yeah, we don't have a standardized approach, but one method which I, I, I explain a little is very often applied and that is called conjoint measurement. It means the following. We don't ask the customers, be it consumers or industrial business customers, how much they are willing to pay. You, you, you don't get a valid and honest answer about that. But we confront them with different product alternatives that if you think of a car that may be the, the, the gasoline consumption the, for an electric car, the, the, the range the car can drive, the design, the brand, etc., together with the price and they make choices between two alternatives a couple of these choices and with a sophisticated computer model we can calculate 
the perceived value behind these attributes. How much is the mileage? How much is the design? How much is the brand? What is the value of this? And uh, that we can translate into uh, simulation models where we tell our client, if you do that and that with the attribute, you will sell more, you can charge more, you will get this market share, et cetera. And uh, uh, our, our biggest area is actually pharmaceuticals or life sciences in general, where you also have these features, the physic efficacy of a, of, a, of a new pharmaceutical, the uh, ease of, of using it, uh, the side effects, et cetera. And there we ask, of course, if it's, prescription drugs, we ask doctors or, or people in, in university clinics if it's very, very innovative. So it depends on whom we ask to study this and uh, how we phrase the, the model, you could say, or the questions to find out what's the true value behind certain attributes of a product or a service is. Where do you see... So we your... know why people are willing to pay double the price for an Apple iPhone than for a Samsung iPhone, uh, for a Samsung phone. We, we know the reasons behind that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you, it, it, and that information, that, that knowledge probably changes pretty frequently, correct? Uh, that depends on the product. Of course, for fashion products, short-lived fashion products, for some products, it's quite stable. For instance, for, for, for pharmaceuticals, it's quite stable. The value of health and how you keep health, how you gain back health, does not change that much. So it uh, depends on the, on the product, how volatile uh, these preferences are. Where do you see your yourself and your 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 company uh, going in the next five years? Um, currently, I said we have seventeen hundred and fifty employees, and we had last year a revenue of five hundred and twenty-two million dollars. And in the next five years, in revenue, we will break the one billion threshold and uh, double our workforce. We want to grow by, by about uh, 15% per year, and that means duplication in about five years. And what about yourself? I, I know you've, I think, written three books. Do you plan to write more? I'm just finalizing a book on inflation, how to price, how to cope with inflation. The working title is Beating Inflation, the guide for entrepreneurs and managers. And... Uh, I, I will finalize the German text probably this week, and uh, we will have an American version in about three, four months. We're, and, and I mean, I guess I'd probably be doing a disservice. I just didn't at least ask. Uh, here is one book which I could also recommend about profitability, true profit. No company ever went broke turning a profit. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> that was it, it, published just a few months ago. And if you go in the show Ooh, notes, profit. if you go in the show notes, you'll be able to find all the links uh, for Herman's information and his, his company. Uh, what actually? What's the best way for people to stay in touch with uh, upcoming books, upcoming speaking engagements that you're going to be doing, Herman? Herman Simon in one word dot com. That's my homepage, and there you will find all information on books, on speaking engagements, etc. Now, yeah, I'd be so I'd be doing a disservice. Where do you see? inflation going in you mean in the next you mean yeah. couple of years and how it's yeah. going to play effect on the the market uh, first the specter of inflation is back and it, it has come back much faster than most people anticipated and it's going to stay with us for a very very long time there are two main causes Short-term causes like the Ukraine crisis, uh, global supply chains, uh, COVID-19, they will pass. But one thing will not pass, that's the bloated up money supply. The money supply has tripled in the last couple of years. And during the same time, the global cross domestic product has only gone up 30%. So there's too much money chasing too few 
products, and that is not going uh, to be to be uh, solved in the next five or ten years, uh, because the, the the central banks are not increasing uh, the interest rate to uh, a level which would stop that, because that would mean trouble for banks, for states, for governments, etc. So my my prediction is. Uh, we will experience a similar inflation as in the 1970s. That's long ago. We don't have experience. Most people who are in a responsible, uh, a responsible position don't have experience with this. So, yeah, we had an inflation which lasted 10 years hmm. with an average of about 5%. And uh, interest rates of up for, for mortgages of up to 14, 12, 14% which uh, in, in the couple last couple of years, uh, interest rates were close to zero. In, in, in Germany, they were close to zero. In the US, they were at one, two percent for, for mortgages. And uh, this will be a very, very different time we experience with inflation in the next couple of years. So I cannot give you an optimistic uh, expectation on this issue. So you would it think- It makes that... pricing the more important, because if you cannot pass on your cost increases, you will you have a profit squeeze and it will be difficult to survive for companies and also for, for consumers who are not well off. Do you, do you have a number in mind of how many companies you think won't be able to make it through the next, I mean, X amount of years with inflation? Or is there, I mean, thoughts of that? that... It would not, I could not give you a serious number. Okay. That is too speculative. I got you. Um, looking back at your uh, younger self, the person that just became a professor, is there any advice you'd give to that person that maybe might have helped them get to where you are today a little bit faster? Yeah. I have a motto from the Roman philosopher Seneca, which I always use, which I always preach to our employees. That's per aspera ad astra, which means on rough roads to the stars. Hmm. So you should have the ambition to never lose the sight of the stars, to get to the stars, but be prepared that you will not achieve that on smooth roads, but on rough roads. Per aspera ad astra, on rough roads to the stars. I, I, well, I, I'll finish off with this last question then. Um, how do how do you yourself get through the rough times? You don't have to let all the trouble and stress come into you. So you have to develop a certain resistance against external influences, trouble with customers, trouble with employees, uh, trouble with with everything. You have to, to, to a certain kind, iso isolate yourself, insulate yourself against the stress from the outside. I think that is very important for uh, a long-term entrepreneurial career and success. Well, again, Herman, thank you uh, for being here. Hopefully everyone listening got some, some great nuggets. I mean, there's positivity in, in where Herman came from, yet... I think we finish it off where where inflation might be going in the next ten years. Uh, I mean, we're going to be going possibly uh, through some hard times. But remember, just like Herman said, I mean, you need the hard times to get to where you want to get to. Have that goal in mind. Yeah. Have that plan yeah. in mind. Uh, and go in the show notes and find Herman's books. Um, especially if you're you're a business, an entity, a company uh, looking to, to maximize your profits. Thanks again, Herman, for being here. Everyone, please subscribe, please share, and go in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs>